Greetings! It is I, Tantus Naravan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue my discussion on the history of Magic the Gathering, where I go set by set, release by release, giving you some information about it, explaining everything, cards, history, mechanics, everything you need to know to understand these interesting sets that Wizards of the Coast has released. So let's dive into it today with Lorowin, the first set in the block of its name. So it was released on October 12th, 2007, and had 301 cards. This was the first set in the Lorowin mini block of two sets, which happened to be paired with another mini block, the Shadowmore mini block of two sets, to create a four block, four set mega block that represented an entire year's worth of releases. Magic, during this time period, began to do their four set release a year which they have focused on since then, we can see that this is the representation of it in its purest form. Now, it had the themes of Planeswalker and Tribal, and the keywords Champion, Changeling, Clash, Invoke, Death Touch, and of course, Hideaway. It is very important to note that this set had Tribal themes. But the tribal themes were presented in a much different way than they were in the previously tribal theme block of Onslaught. So we're seeing an evolution. We also saw the introduction of the Planeswalker card, which was of course a completely new card type, which we hadn't seen since the beginning of Magic, truthfully. Now, there were no humans in this set also, save for a few of the Planeswalkers, which were human. Other than that, no humans. It also presented fantasy in a much different way than had been previously shown in magic sets. The fantasy it represented was completely different mythos. This is seen in a way in its symbol. Lorwyn's symbol is thought to represent one of two things. Maybe an elf ear, or maybe a leaf. It's really hard to say what it represents, and that ambiguity is connected to the way that the set was seen. And functioned. So the story has Lorwyn, this world we're being introduced to, where nature is in its most pristine state at all times, where the sun is always at the midsummer's crest. It never ends. The creatures there do not know gloom. They do not know misfortune. But they know rivalry with each other. And so our story stems from this. This is a world inspired by a lot of Celtic folklore along with some of the other folklore from various cultures within the British Isles and areas similar to it. So it has this melting pot of cultures in that area that we're seeing examples of. So this set had a 75 card tournament pack, of course, booster packs, with 16 cards in each of them, five pre-constructed theme decks, and a fat pack. And every product except for the Booster packs had a Pro Tour card inside of them. A number of the basic lands, which were shown off within 10th edition, which we talked about when we could have seen some of them there, were paired together to create mini murals. So you could put the lands side by side to see small murals. The pre-release was on September 29th and 30th of 2007 and had as a pre-release card a foil alternate art Rens Run Packmaster. It was chosen because it represented some of the keywords and abilities of the, of the set and the tribal themes of the set. Now, there was also a release card in Shriek Mall, which, to a degree, did the same thing. Now, it was accompanied by a novel the same name. It is important to note here that there was a special event that we want to talk about. From December 1st to January 3rd, so going from 2007 into 2008, there were one-day events held at local game stores representing Lorwyn. These were called the Tribal Wars. It was made to basically boost the popularity of this tribal theme and bring people into it. Now, like 10th edition before, there was a 16th bonus card in all of these packs. But unlike 10th edition, there were different for its numbers. This set had five specific rules cards and 11 token cards. So there was 16 different normal cards, let's say, 
the token cards also included Elvish Warrior, all of these would have a back of an advertisement, which there were six different advertisement that could be paired with them. So in fact, when it seems like there's only 16 of these, there's really 16 times six, because each one of them could have one of these six advertisements on the back. So Planeswalker, they were brought in here. The fact is they were intended for future sight as I previously mentioned, but they were not ready to be released until now. They did contain the same storyline. Effectively, with the end of future sight, there was the change in the storyline that said the nature of planeswalkers was changing. And that's canon to the story. Here we're seeing that your player is supposed to represent a planeswalker. So with the change in the power of you as a planeswalker, we now see that you can invoke and bring about the favor and assistance of other planeswalkers to help you in battle. And that's what it should feel like as you as a planeswalker are calling on another planeswalker to help you. Now, as I said, the tribal themes here were very different than Onslaught's tribal themes. The exception being that there were two creature types that were within Onslaught that are the same here, elves and goblins. All the other creature types are ones that were not focused on within Onslaught before. Also, each creature here has at least two colors that will represent them. There are eight tribes in representation here. Each one will have a primary color and then one or more secondary colors. So again, I was saying at least two colors. The exception is there is a ninth tribe, the changelings, but the changelings are made to effectively work with any of the other tribes. They're all the colors of mana. They work with any of the other tribes. Now let's talk about the keywords that were introduced. Champion. Champion is a keyword that when it comes into play, you have to exile a creature of a mentioned type or you sacrifice the champion creature. The, with this champion creature leaves the battlefield, leaves play, the exiled creature returns to play. This is effectively made to overlay a more powerful creature on a weaker one. It, traditionally, it has the same type as it's championing. So if it's an elf, it's championing an elf that you would remove an elf and like, oh yes, I have this champion elf who's much better that maybe that other elf got an upgrade? Hard to say how exactly you're envisioning it, but it's made to overlay a creature on top of another. Changeling is a static ability that this creature is all creature types. Now specifically, it has been eroded at this point in time that it's all creature types that are in play. Or if you're playing something that would have a creature type or mention a creature type, then it triggers as that creature type. It's all the creature types that it needs to be at the time. Other than that, if it's not triggering any other creature type, mentioning any other creature type, it does not count as those at that point in time until it is necessary to be them. A little complex, but it's all creature types at all times as necessary. <laughs> as is appropriate to what's going on on the battlefield, effectively. But this was making a keyword version of Mistform Ultimatus' ability, which we had before. Clash has each clashing player reveal the top cards of their library. Then they can either put that card on the top or bottom of their library. The winning player wins if the revealed card has higher converted mana cost. That's basically it. So two players reveal... Two or more players reveal the top cards of the library. Whoever has the highest converted mana cost wins this clash, puts the bot rest on the bottom of their library, and whoever wins the clash usually gets some advantage. Traditionally, this advantage may only be to the one playing the clash card. Sometimes it will mention an advantage that will occur to the winner if it's not the person that played the card. It depends on the clash card itself. We saw Death Touch. Death Touch, when it deals damage to a creature, destroy that creature. This ability was of course introduced in Future Sight, but now we've seen an expansion of it. There are six cards within this set that have it mixed between black and green. All of them are related to elves. It was seen that elves had a special material that gave them Death Touch. Invoke was both a static and a triggered ability. Let me explain. Invoke allowed you to play a creature with its invoke cost rather than its normal mana cost. It would mention invoke, you'd pay that cost instead. But instead of what it would do before, when the creature would come into play, you'd sacrifice it afterwards. So if you paid the invoke cost, 
comes into play, then you sacrifice it right away. So it only hits play briefly before it goes away. It effectively is part of casting it with the invoke cost. You're sacrificing it. So it's all in one quick effect. The point of it is comes into play effects. All these invoke creatures, at least most of them, had effects that when you would play them, they would have their own come into play effect. The fact is, they could easily be paired with other things that have triggers when a creature comes into play that would allow you to have effects or creatures leaving the battlefield too. It was a way of throwing something out for cheaper, getting an effect, then it goes away. Hideaway is the final keyword that was introduced here. Hideaway was on a number of lands. Effectively, when I put a hideaway land into the play, I would then take a card from the top of my library. Each one would say differently what it would do. And I would exile it. Then, when my hideaway land reaches a certain trigger, it will mention on there, I can play this card exiled without paying its mana cost. That's it. It allows you to temporarily hide away the card, and when my hideaway requirements are met, I can play that card. Pretty little interesting mechanic that I can throw something away temporarily, only to play at a later time when I'm able to, when I can trigger it. And the without paying its mana cost ability was really nice. Here, traditionally, it would give you an option of a number of cards. So there were eight cycles within this set. The first off is the commands. The commands were rare modal spells that have you four different options. The thing about the commands was you choose two of them instead of one. So these were unique for modal spells as rather than just choosing usually one different mode, you choose two different modes every time you'd cast one. There was a cycle of the hideaway lands. As I was talking about before, these are lands with the hideaway ability that each of them could tap for a mana of a color they were linked to. Each of them, when it came into play, would have Hideaway, where you'd reveal, look at the top four cards of your library, put Exile 1, put the rest on the bottom of your library. And then, of course, they would have a trigger, which would allow you to play that Exiled card without paying its mana cost. There was a cycle of Incarnations. These were meant to be similar to the Incarnations that were seen within Onslaught. Each of them had powerful abilities that would help you out. And if you should put them into the graveyard from anywhere, you would shuffle them into your library. So they were hard to get rid of. There was, of course, the cycle of Planeswalkers, one of each color, introducing us to the Planeswalker card type. There was a cycle of Uncommon Changelings, each with a keyword ability. A cycle of Common Changelings, just that. A cycle of Vivid Lands. These were lands that would come into play with two counters on them. This land could either be tapped for a mana of the appropriate color, or you could tap it and remove a counter and add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Of course, this ability requires you to have counters on it. Once you run out of those counters, you can no longer tap it for any color mana, but you could still tap it for the original mana. And there was also the cycle of clash creatures. When they came into play, you would clash with an opponent. If you'd win the clash, you'd put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. Now, there were also seven tribal cycles. These are different than the cycles I just talked about. The cycles I just talked about, color-based cycles. These were based on creature type. Now, this is to say that not every one of the eight tribes had every one of these seven cards. There were some cards that every tribe would have, others most of the tribes would have. So, when I'm talking about these, I'm not saying that there is 56 cards out there that you're going to fill in this entire thing. No. But most of this set of cards will be in existence. So when I talk about each of these seven different cycles, majority of the eight tribes will have a representation of each of these. Some, as I said, all. There were the champions. These, of course, were members of the tribe that had the champion ability that would champion the type of car creature from that tribe. Simple as that. There were the Harbingers. When they would come into play, you would search your library for a creature of the chosen type and then put it on the top of your library. It allowed you to Harbinger in another creature of the type that it was. There were the Revealers. The Revealers would be played at a cheaper than normal cost, effectively what it would have been. The disadvantage is you would either have to play three more colorless mana or reveal a creature of the type that it is 
or sacrifice it once you come into play. So I play it, and I either have to play an extra three mana, which makes it more appropriate to the type of number of mana I should have paid to play this in the first place, or reveal a creature of its type from my hand. And then I just keep it out. There was a cycle of token makers. They would make tokens, of course, of the appropriate type equivalent to the tribe that it's in. These usually had some kind of ability connected with it where you could either sacrifice these tokens for effect or tap these tokens for an effect that would be listed under these token generators. Now before I continue on with the cycles, I did forget to mention something very important about the tribal supertype that was introduced previously in Future Sight. Remember, it's associated with cards of other types. And with the tribes here, we had tribal cards that were other card types that would have a creature type. Important to note here that I did not note before. We talked about tribal back in the previous set. I should reiterate it here because guess what the next one in the tribal cycle is? Tribal cantrips. So of course these are not creature types, creature type spells, but they're spells that have a creature type associated with them. There you go. So the tribal cantrips of course had an ability, but they wouldn't necessarily allow you to draw a card. If you controlled a creature of the appropriate type, then you could draw a card. Hence, tribal tra cantrips. Anyway, moving on though, there were the tribal legends. This one is the one that I really want to say has a representation of each of the eight tribes in it. There's a legend of each of the eight tribes here, and it is represents all the colors of that tribe. So... Each color that that tribe would have, that's the colors the legend will be. So they're all multicolored creatures. And the last one were tribal lords. These were uncommon creature, uncommon or rare creatures that would effectively give a bonus to other creatures of that type. It would grant a bonus to whatever tribe it's lording over. Now there was one reprint here, Fertile Ground. Plus there was one functional reprint, Hornet Harasser for Diseased Carrier. Now, the pre-constructed decks were a white deck called Kithkin Militia, a white-blue called Marrow Riverways, a black-red called Bogard Feast, a black-green called Elvish Predation, and a rainbow deck called Elemental's Path. Now, let's talk about some of the cards from the set. There was Dorian the Siege Tower. Dorian was interesting because it had a special ability that each creature deals damage with their toughness rather than their power. This means that it made every creature both deal damage and take damage with their toughness. It, without actually changing their power, they made it that they're effectively blank blank, whatever their toughness would be, uh, effectively, even though, again, there wasn't a change. So if you had a toughness of seven, you would deal seven damage instead of what your power would do, and you could also take seven damage. You're the same as a seven seven. You're the same as a seven seven without actually being one. There was Gaddock Teague. Non-creature spells with a converted mana cost of four or higher can't be cast. Non-creature spells of a, with an X in its casting cost can't be cast. It shuts down a lot of types of decks and especially shuts down a lot of type of spells that aren't, well, creature spells. Ponder. You can look at the top three cards of your library and put them back in any order. You may shuffle your library. Draw a card. So Ponder is really great because not only can you look at the top three cards, if they're all terrible and you don't want any of them, shuffle your library, and you still get to draw a card to replace Ponder. Thought Seize. Look at target opponent's hand. Choose a non-land card from it. They discard that card. You lose two life. So you do lose two life as part of this, but you can look at your opponent's hand and take anything out of it and get rid of it. Ingot Chewer. This is one of the invoke creatures with an invoke of one red mana. When you would invoke it, well, when it would come into the battlefield, you can destroy target artifact. So for one red, you can invoke it, destroy an artifact, or you could always cast it and destroy an artifact and have a creature. Mole Drifter. It has an invoke of two colorless, one blue. When it comes into the battlefield, you draw two cards. So for two colorless, one blue, you could just draw two cards. You would have invoked it. Or you can have a creature out and draw two cards. Shriek Maw. It has an invoke of one colorless, one black. 
When Streak Maul comes into, the, into play, you destroy target non-black, non-artifact creature. So it has the exact same casting cost as Terror if you invoke it. I can invoke it for what would have been Terror, and it does the exact same thing. That's a little bit of a throwback to the classics there that, that matches so perfectly. I love it. So there's Cryptic Command. It's one of the command modal spells. So you choose two of these. Counter target spell. Return target permanent to its owner's hand. Tap all creatures target player controls. Or draw a card. It's a little interesting set of things you could do there with this one. Profane Command, another command one, was an X cost camp command. So you would have, of course, X cost and the mana cost. You would either have target player lose X life, return target creature with a converted mana cost of X or less from the graveyard to the battlefield, target creature gets minus X minus X until end of turn, or X creatures gain fear until end of turn. So it's an interesting selection in this one, too. So there was a Johnny Goldman. Let me give a brief expose on how Planeswalkers work. Granted, you probably know how they work if you're a modern Magic player, but if you're a classic player watching this series, I'll help you out. They have a number of loyalty counters on them. They have abilities that go up and down depending on how many loyalty counters you either add or subtract. Each one has a plus number, minus numbers, usually two to three abilities, sometimes four, and their loyalty represents health they have. When you, a player would be dealt damage, it could theoretically be redirected to the Planeswalker instead of you. It's things that would target players, could target them. When you're attacked, the opponent attacking you has to choose to tell you if they're attacking you particularly or your Planeswalker. And you get one effect for free when you come into play. Otherwise, you use it as a sorcery once a turn. Bam. Brief expose on how Planeswalkers work. Let's talk about a Johnny. He has a tick what? Tick up of plus one, you gain two life. A tick down of minus one, all creatures you control get a plus one, plus one counter. And a tick down of six, that you get a white avatar creature token, where it has a power and toughness of star, where star is the amount of life you have. There was Arbiter of Null Ridge. It has vigilance, and when it enters the battlefield, each player's life total becomes the life total that is highest among all players. So you effectively can use it to make everybody's lives the same, but the highest life that's out there. There's Bogart Mob. It's the champion of Goblin Goblin. When a goblin you control deals combat damage to an opponent, you may put a 1-1 one, one black goblin rogue token into play. So each time your uh, one of your goblins damages an opponent, you get a goblin. Goblin sh Bogart Shenanigans. When a goblin you control is put into the graveyard from play, when another goblin you control is put in the graveyard from play, Goblin Bogart Shenanigans does one damage to target player. Bridget of the Kinsbale, first strike. You may tap Bridget to do two damage blocking or attacking creature target player controls. So effectively, it's like one of those tap deal damage to an attacking or blocking creatures, except Bridget does damage to everything on one side of the board. Brian Stout Arm, it's got lifelink. For one red mana, tap it, sacrifice a creature. You do damage to target player equal to the sacrifice creature's power. So Bridget effectively chucks something, it dies. You gain life because of the lifelink. Caterwauling Bogarts. Goblins you control cannot be blocked except by two or more creatures. Elementals you control cannot be blocked except by two or more creatures. Goblins and elementals you control have menace. Four menace was a keyword. But it gave it them. So then we had Chandra Nalar, another planeswalker, Alexandra. She has tick up one, deal one damage to target player, tick down X, deal X damage to target creature, or tick down eight, deals ten damage to target player in each creature he or she controls. So she burned things really well. Death render. Equip two. Equip creature gets plus two plus two. If a crit creature dies, you may take a creature card from your hand and put it into the battlefield with Death Render attached to it. So, this is an interesting one that has big potential for combos, especially if you have tokens and ways of sacrificing tokens. You get a token out, 
attach death render, sacrifice it, you get something big from your hand at a cost of zero. Death render is very good. Dolmen Gate. Prevent all combat damage that we dealt to attacking creatures you control. Guess what? I can just throw out creatures to attack because they don't take damage from combat. Dolmen Gate is wonderful if you want to be extra aggressive. Dread. It is one of the incarnations. It's a 6-6 six, six fear. If a creature deals damage to you, destroy it. Not just combat damage. Whenever a creature deals damage to you, destroy it. And if Dread would be put into the graveyard from anywhere, shuffle it into its owner's library. Dread's a really nice one for a black one. Drowner of Secrets. Tap and untap Murfolk you control. Target player puts the top card of their library in their graveyard. Do you make it that you can mill people with Murfolk? The more Murfolk you have, the more mill you can do to your opponents. There was Elvish Promenade. Put a 1-1 green elven warrior, elf warrior creature token into the battlefield for each elf you control. So you double your number of elves you have. Eye Bites Ending. Destroy target non-elf creature. Specifically non-elf. It's pretty good that way. Favor of the Mighty. Each creature with the highest converted mana cost has protection from all colors. So if you have something that has a very high mana cost, granted it could be tied with something else with a very high mana cost, but whatever's on the battlefield with the highest mana cost, protection from all colors. So if you're playing with really expensive creatures, guess what? They're protected. Forced Fruition. When an opponent successfully casts a spell, they draw seven cards. This is a mean one because you can have your player an opponent draw out their deck really quickly. Every time they cast a spell, they have to draw seven cards. Think about how many spells they can play before they run out of cards. And they might not be in a position to beat you. Guilt Leaf Seer. For one green tap it, look at the top two cards of your library, put them back in any order. You can look at what two cards are going to come up next, and you could always get rid of that one but you can effectively look at that too and figure out what you're getting next. It's actually not bad to get a little glimpse of the future. Guile, another of the incarnations. This one cannot be blocked except by three or more creatures. Really hard to block Guile here. If a spell or build you control would counter a spell, instead of countering it, you exile that spell. Then you may play that exiled spell without paying its mana cost. Guile allows you to steal a spell you're countering, rather than just to counter it. And of course, if Guile would be put into the graveyard from anywhere, shuffle it into its owner's library. Hamelback Goliath. When another creature enters the battlefield, you may put X plus one plus one counters on Hamelback Goliath, where X is that creature's power. The more po creatures you play, the bigger the Goliath gets. Horde of Notions. It's rainbow. It's an elemental. It has Vigilance, Trample, Haste. For one of every color mana, five colors, you may play an, a target elemental card from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. That means elemental cards in graveyards, you can put them back into play or play them again if it's a tribal spell of some other type. Hostility, another incarnation, and one I love in burn decks. Let me explain why. It's a 6-6 six, six haste. Whenever a spell you control would deal damage to an opponent, prevent that damage. Instead, put that many 3-1 elemental to creature tokens into the battlefield. Each of them has haste. So, if you feel like you want to play a burn deck, but you don't want to kind of be a jerk and burn your opponent to death, instead, create a horde of elementals to overpower them. There's a time and a place for a horde of creatures, and this is not a bad one to create it. Immaculate Magistrate. Tap. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature for each elf you control. So the more elves you have, the more plus one plus one counters you put on that creature. Imperious Perfect. Other elf creatures you have control get plus one plus one. And for one green and tapping it, you may put a one one green elf warrior creature token in the battlefield. So the two of these work very well together. One creates tokens. The other well, makes creatures really, really big because you have a lot of elves. Judge of Currents. When a Murfolk you control becomes tap, you may gain one life. Liliana Vess, another of the Planeswalkers that I really enjoy. For tick up one, target player discards a card. For tick down two, you search your library for a card, shuffle your library, 
and then put that card on top of your library. So granted, you have to draw it next turn, but you can get a card. And for minus eight, put all creatures in all graveyards onto the battlefield under your control. Basically, you look in every graveyard and you get all of it under your control. Lisa Lana Huntmaster. When you replay an elf spell, you may create a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature token. The more elf spells you cast, the more elf warrior tokens you also get. Marrow Ragery. Other merfolk you control get plus one, plus one. Whenever you play a merfolk spell, you may tap or untap target permanent. Malicious Pride. When a non-token creature you control attacks, you may pay one white. If you do, you put a 1-1 one, one white Kithkin soldier creature tapped and attacking onto the battlefield. If you have Dolman's Gate with this, well, you can attack with a lot of creatures, it doesn't matter if they die, and you can create a bunch of tokens to go along with it. Or if you have another way of removing them from combat, you can get a lot of tokens with it. Or you can just get extra creatures you're attacking with. Mirror Entity. It's a changeling. For X. Creature, until end of turn, creatures you control have a base power and toughness of XX and are all creature types. You make all your things changelings, and of course you make them probably much bigger. Nath of Guiltleaf. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may have target opponent discard a card at random. When an opponent discards a card, you put a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature token onto the battlefield. Nettlevine Blight. Enchant creature or land. This permanent has, at the beginning of your end step, sacrifice this permanent and attach Nettlevine Blight to a creature or land you control. So you choose an opponent, you blight something on purpose, and then each turn, it blights something else of theirs. Each turn, they lose something else. Oblivion Ring. When it enters the battlefield, exile target non-land permanent. Another one. When Oblivion Ring leaves the battlefield, you return that exile permanent back to the battlefield. So yes, you can temporarily remove something from the game with Oblivion Ring, or you can do it to yourself if you can get rid of Oblivion Ring to put something back into play for another back into play's effect that you might want. Purity. 6-6 six, six Flyer for the Incarnations. If non-combat damage would be dealt to you, prevent that damage, you gain life equal to the damage prevented. So now you counter burn and other ways that would cause you to do damage to you, and instead you gain life. And then once again, if it would be put into the graveyard from anywhere, shuffle it into your library. Prowls of the Fair. Whenever another non-token elf is put into the graveyard from the battlefield, from play, you create a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior token. Rings of Bright Earth. Whenever you activate an ability, if it isn't a mana ability, so not in a mana ability, you may pay two colorless and copy that ability. New, you can choose new targets for that copy. Effectively, you can double activated abilities just by paying a mana cost. Sign of Ona. It's got flash. It's got flying. Other fairies you control get plus one, plus one. And other fairies you have have shroud. So it is a Decent thing if you're playing a fairy deck to protect your fairies. Soulbright Flamekin. For two mana, target creature gets trample until end of turn. If this is the third time this ability has resolved this turn, add eight red mana to your mana pool. So this is an interesting one because if you activate, if you have six mana, you can make it eight. Six of any color mana, make it eight red. So there is, it's not the greatest, but it does give you two extra mana. If you have enough. Also, you can give three things trample, and it's red. So that that's pretty good, too. Summon the school. Create two blue merfolk wizard tokens. Tap four untap merfolk you control. Return summon the school from your graveyard to your hand. So not only does it create merfolk tokens, if you have enough merfolk, you can get back to your hand to play it again. Sig, river guy. He has island walk. For a cutlass and a white, target merfolk you control gets protection from the color of your choice until end of turn. So for two mana, one of them having to be white, you can just give your merfolk appropriate protection at any time. Thousand Year Elixir. You may activate abilities of creatures you control as though they had haste. This means if your creatures have a lot of activated abilities, you effectively can give them all haste while actually having to give them all haste. And this also has the ability for one tap, untap target creature. So you could have something double their abilities for a turn. Timber Protector. Other tree folk you control get plus one, plus one. Other tree folk and forests you control are indestructible. Ooh, if you're playing a tree folk deck, 
You get two of these out? All your tree folk are indestructible, including each other. Pretty wonderful. And your forest star, too, in case somebody's trying to destroy them. Vigor! It's a 6-6 six, six trample. It's my favorite of the incarnations. If damage be dealt to a creature other than Vigor, prevent that damage. For each one damage prevented, put a plus one plus one counter on that creature. So, effectively, you make it that your creatures do not take damage anymore, other than Vigor, and instead they just get bigger. And, of course, if Vigor would be put into the graveyard from anywhere, you shuffle it back into its owner's library. Wanderwine Prophets, champion of merfolk. When Wanderwine Prophets would deal combat damage to a player, you may sacrifice a merfolk. Take an extra turn. So deal damage, sacrifice a merfolk, take another turn. Wild Ricochet. You may choose new targets for target instant or sorcery. Copy that instant or sorcery, and you may choose new target, choose any target for that copy. So not only do you redirect a spell wherever you want, you copy it and can throw out that copy wherever you want also. I like Wild Ricochet. Wart, Beauregard, Anti. It's got fear. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may turn a goblin card from your graveyard to your hand. She gets you goblin cards back every turn. Ren's Run, Packmaster, Champion and Elf. For two colors and a green, put a 2-2 wolf creature token into the battlefield, and wolves you control have death touch. But... That's it for today. I introduce you to Lorwyn. This is going to be the first set in a mega cycle. A mega cycle, which is something that has never been seen before. Magic hasn't done four sets that are connected together since now. It's an insanity that has never been seen since. Granted, we're expanding on tribal abilities. We're finally introducing planeswalkers. We're doing a lot of great things in this set. But we're going to see how things are going to continue to evolve with this tribal theme and this idealism and experiment that is the Lorwyn and Shadowmere mega cycle as things to come, because there's a lot more to see in this experiment. But if you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like, share, and subscribe at Cheers for the channel, the empire, the work I do. If you want to show some extra support, you can always check out my Patreon, link in the description below. There's some great rewards there. It helps to grow and improve the channel and the empire. But regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.